introduce the next speaker and I'm super excited to be introducing her so I hope I introduce her surname correctly. Um, our next presenter is Dr. Miriam Juni. Um, Dr. Miriam began her life in the early childhood community as an untrained assistant. She now has an associate diploma in social science child studies from Mossvale Tate. Bachelor of Education Early Childhood with honours from the University of Western Sydney. Miriam recently graduated with her PhD in Early Childhood Education at the University of Melbourne. Miriam enjoys working across many facets of the early childhood community, nationally and internationally. Miriam is currently a postdoctoral research fellow in the Childhood no. Research Collective. No, you're not. I've moved on from that. Okay, skip that bit. She's passionate about social justice. She plays a leadership role in the social justice in early childhood group and the Sydney Critical Curriculum community. Miriam was part of the CSU consortium that produced the Early Years Learning Framework. Miriam is the co-editor of Talking Up and Speaking Out, Aboriginal and Multicultural Voices in Early Childhood published by Patty Mellon Press. Today she's here to speak out about whose activism is it anyway. Please help me to welcome Dr. Miriam Juni. I'm exhausted listening to all of that. I need a cocktail. Um, so I would um, like to begin by acknowledging that we're on Gadigal country and to acknowledge Elders past and present. I'd like to acknowledge any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here. Um, I'd also like to um, ask you, when you hear an acknowledgement of country, um, what next? Because I think it's all lovely to have a ceremony that not all Aboriginal people necessarily support or agree with, but we kind of still do it. Um, it's a great debate we're having in my very new beautiful workplace. Um, and you know, whose language are we speaking? Um, what does it mean to be acknowledging in the language of the coloniser? Um, and what are we going to do when you walk away from here? Because it's it's so lovely and we all feel good that we do it. Oh, that person didn't do it. Oh my God, what's going on? Um, but I think that there are broader questions to ask and we do need to be more critical of ourselves and of the um, ceremonial procedures that we assume to be truth. So, it's always real simple with me, isn't it? Um, so, I've got this um, image that I'm going to have up here, and normally when I put these images up here together, I ask the question, what counts as valid knowledge? And, you know, the good kind of true activist, lefty, social justice people always go, yes, of course we, of course we accept this, um, the map on the right-hand side, you know, that we know is Aboriginal Australia, which is made by a guy called Tyndale, who actually wasn't Aboriginal. Um, and we, we say, yes, yes, we do accept it as um, valid knowledge. But you don't say, you don't use the words of the names of the countries that are plotted on that map to say, oh, yeah, I'm just going up to Gimilaroi country today. You say, I'm going to um, Tamworth or wherever it is. So I guess I want to say, well, what do we really mean by accepting valid knowledge? Um, and whose activism is it anyway? Um, a couple of years ago, I was having a conversation with a colleague of mine, Sally Barnes, in South Australia, and it's always like three days on the phone um, when you're chatting with her. And she had sent me a um, quarterly essay. I'm trying to think. Of, I think it was Noel Pearson who had written it, this article. And people were, you know, getting all cross about Noel Pearson because he was siding with the right and friends with whoever that right person was. And all of these, you know, hot, flustery air was whirling around. And shortly after that, Marsha Langton, who's um, another Indigenous scholar, had written a piece in, I think it was the, the Australian, and kind of, you know, tending toward liberal right politics. And we kind of had this conversation to say, well, what does it mean to um, position ourselves in... I'm just seeing all these faces that people haven't seen for ages. My family. 
Um, what does it mean to, for us to say, oh, well, I know someone, or I'm liaising with the community, or I'm doing this, and therefore I'm going to shape my, my, my left-wing politics that are non-conservative around these particular views that I access? Because I'd read these two things, I was quite confronted by them, and I thought, there has to be a new thought. And this is what Anthony's asking us to do, and Liam, and I'm sure everybody else did today. I'm very sorry that I wasn't here to hear it, but I will be watching the video. Um, and I thought to myself, you know, how long have we been trying to battle this fight and we say, oh, we don't get enough money and the money's not distributed well, it's in bits and pieces, it's not big funds sustainably, it's not, you know, institutionalised, blah, blah, blah. And I've been ranting on like that for years. Um, and then I guess I got to the point to say, well, why do we assume that left-wing politics or um, non-conservative politics are actually effective? Because I kind of had this terrible, you know, Hall of Mirror moment thinking, it's not working. So the people who we're advocating for are going, okay, lovely, you've done what you can, not working enough, let's go somewhere else. And it's interesting to see over time, I mean, obviously the Labor Party is now going to the Liberal Party for help as well, um, and even the Greens are kind of approaching Labor, clearly. So where is the left, and what does the left do? And what happens when we realise that there are these conservative agendas coming through the very communities that we're advocating for, or with, or beside, or around. Now, I, it makes me sick to my stomach to, um, to think this, because it's just, you know, against the truth, I guess, I've produced as an activist over the years. But if we don't start thinking that, then what are the risks? What are the risks if we just continue with, no, we'll make this fight, we'll do it better, we'll speak louder, we'll, you know, all of that sort of stuff. Um, what happens if we do that? And we, we ignore the other side. The other side. Oh, Miriam, don't be so judgmental. Um, I might even vote for the next election. <laughs> so don't tell anybody I said that. Um, so these are the thoughts that have been rolling around my head. And I, I guess it's hard to talk about them in a lounge room conversation because people start thinking, oh, she's really talking, isn't she? And you lose um, attention if you're suddenly seem to be batting for the other side. And um, I just wonder though, you know, the bravery that we sort of get, um, what's the word I'm looking for? You know, pe 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 people kind of give you badges of, um, I don't know, ad admiration I suppose when you are an activist because it is hard to speak out. Um, and you, you know, you can lose jobs and you can be maimed and excluded and be told oh, you just go too far and all those kinds of things. Clearly I've experienced all of that. Uh, quite good at that actually. And, um, it, you know, that's troubling because you've got to find new ways to talk about things. Now my new way to talk about things is starting to consider what the other side is doing, what we can actually learn from it. And this is not new. George Lakoff wrote a book in, I don't know, 2004 maybe, called Don't Think of an Elephant. And he was talking about how the right has actually taken up the discourse of, you know, um, progressive parties like Labor um, and, and other kind of left-wing parties. And I think that it was a really interesting book because once that happened and, you know, right-wing people were using the discourse of the left, we had nothing to say. And then, of course, the left went, oh, right, we'll, we'll just go this way. Then. So everybody's kind of just moving around. And... That dawned on me when um, John Howard announced that um, sending troops to Iraq was an act of social justice. And I, I was just astonished because, you know, my world of social justice was constructed in this particular kind of truth, and that that was a that was a threat to me. And how many people did it serve? What effect did it have? It had us all rolling in our shoes, and you know running off for a cocktail and thinking we've got to reconstruct our activism. How do we do that? Can we get lefter than left? Is it left that we need to go? Maybe we we need to um, think again. So I want to kind of, you know, move into the right. Do you think they'll take me seriously? Um, Hi. Not with those shoes. <laughs> I reckon I can lord it over them with these ones, these plotters. Um, so I think it, it's also the message that um, many of the activists who've been in early childhood for years and years have been saying, well, you don't just talk to who's in government, you always talk to who's in opposition, and anybody else who may look like they'll have a political seat at any minute, you know, so rock stars, um, you know, government <laughs> people shows. Um, because I think our repertoire of who we're lobbying and, and the types of 
um, conversations we're having with them, uh, they are making a contribution, there's no doubt about that, but the very contributions that we're seeking, um, I think our strategy needs to change. The other thing is, you know, it's tricky, I, I love to work with theory, but to me theory is an everyday practice and people often say, oh that's up there in the sky and that's too hard and you've got to work your way up and then you can do that, leave that and it's too hard and blah blah, and I've got so many examples where that's just not the case. Um, and I think about, well, what vision do we actually have? Have we ever said, so we don't like this and they're not doing that and universal and all those things, which I'm sitting here agreeing with, I'm making the same arguments, but what is the big picture vision? What is the institutionalised change that we want? You know, what, what are we actually asking for? And I think that, you know, blue sky, oh, that's blue skies, we, you know, that we'll never reach that. Well, I think if we don't have those opportunities to dream and push and reinvent and theorise from many different angles, not just one, but many, and go be our own devil's advocates, then I think we're, we're going to constantly um, stop ourselves from having the courage, if you like, to, to go and ask for what we really, really want. What do we want? Tell me about it. There's always a song. Um, so, I won't sing it though. Um, so I guess that's what I'm thinking about now, and that makes me feel uncertain. It makes me worry. What would I do? What if I had, you know, unlimited funds, unlimited political power? What would I do? What would you do? Who would you consult with? How would you develop it? And I mean, whose activism is it anyway? Think about the colonial implications of policy. Um, think about, you know, when are Indigenous knowledges ever drawn on? We'll, we'll get somebody who's supporting the government to give their view and we'll have that we're going to be inclusive and that's kind of it. Um, and I'm wondering whether there... I, I don't want to um, make the assumption that we, non-Indigenous people, should be entitled to Indigenous knowledges. If I hear one more person that's going to connect with the community, I'm, I'm going to pass out because that gives an assumption that we're entitled to do that and that when communities don't connect with us, it's, you know, they're just one answer the phone. But, you know, if there are knowledges that we can um, draw on in different ways and new ways that are about this place and how people have come to know this place prior to colonisation and the ways in which those knowledges have been passed down through generations, I wonder if there would be different questions that we took seriously, seriously, and learned to dream, not in our way, but learn to dream in a way that has been happening on this land for a very long time. And I'm not saying that to be all lovely and romantic and inclusive. I'm saying it because I reckon it would absolutely do our heads in to seriously, to take this seriously, to go into a space of unknowing and go into a space of responsibility of living on stolen land and dreaming on someone else's land in a way that doesn't necessarily reflect them, them um, or us for that matter. Um, and in a way, I guess we're disadvantaging ourselves. So this is what goes on in my head, and uh, I, don't know, I won't tell you what else is going on in there. Um, but I wonder whether, and I don't want to make it an Indigenous perspective, and I don't want to um, limit it to any of those um, methods that we have now. I want an opportunity to into a new space. Um, you know, there's always that talk of, oh, the sector's so fragmented and it's all this sort of stuff. If we keep saying it's fragmented, then it's fragmented. Um, if we keep saying uh, we've got to, you know, shout down the streets and be, um, you know, a noisy and um, agitative, it's probably not even a word, but anyway, there we go. I'm very highly qualified early childhood teacher. Um, <laughs> if you say to me, to you, um, then I think that also, and I've learned that from people saying to me, you know, have a think about this, this and this, what's your strategy? Sometimes a bit of schmooze, you know, goes a bit further than a bit of rah. So, um, I wonder whether, I don't know what your outcome of the day is or your um, opportunity of the day is, but I wonder whether there could be a different kind of space that is not necessarily just about words, it is about where we are and who's here and who's here with us and the implication of that. And what could potentially happen if we dared to dream, really dared to dream without a but, without a, oh, but we've got to do this first, without a that, to suspend ourselves in a place of unknowing and really have the experience of, um, of thinking, well, what else is actually already here that we just tokenistically go, oh, yes, we acknowledge that, and it's valid knowledge, but really and truly 
what could we potentially learn? You know, um, a lot of the stuff, you know, we're talking about communities and when we're not individuals, we're all part of, you know, um, we're interdependent, all those things. Those ideas have existed for years and years and some wacky white academics whack their name to it and we're all quoting them madly. You know, this is what happens with knowledge um, as it comes around and I think how could we do that differently and how can we actually start a different kind of education with children differently? So um, I've recently had a massive promotion <laughs> into the classroom and um, I've been whinging for four years that I haven't been face to face with children and I'm, thank goodness I'm back, it's just like, whew, uh, I'm normal again. And it's really interesting having those, you know, been four weeks, but boy, there's been a lot happening. Um, and the conversations I'm having with children already about these things, if we actually listen to what children are saying, their, their, their <laughs> regulation of knowledge and their, their resistance to systems is so honed. And yet we, we're busy trying to sort that out. I reckon they're the people that we should be getting these big dreaming ideas from, you know, as not necessarily that they know about what's going on in Australia, but I think that that idea of being so regulated and, and so indentured in the systems and thinking that we know them to navigate them, I think that's sometimes our worst enemy. So I think, you know, get a couple of mavericks around because I think that they're the, the geniuses and they're the ideas people and then find the very clever, conservative strategies to go and sell it to the people who um, develop policies on our behalf and decide whether or not we're going to have an NQF or not. So that's what's been on my mind. Um, it, it would be wonderful to be able to have some kind of follow-up that isn't um, usual, that isn't predictable, that forces us to um, speak in ways that we may not have necessarily spoken for or listened before. I don't know what that is. But I would seriously say to you, right now, write down that question, what do you really want? Because we all go, oh, that's so terrible, and that politician, this old, oh, just said a terrible thing they said. Well, sometimes I think the education in universities is second grade. You know, they're not well funded. <laughs> academics are, you know, pulling their hair out. I've seen many bold academics lately. You know, they're, they're work, their working conditions, you know, marking papers, all of that sort of stuff, the workloads, it's incredible. And I think, well, you know, if they were well resourced, then it would be different. So the second rateness is not the problem of the people in the universities, it's actually the way that they're funded and the policy that surrounds them. So that's the other thing around falling into the seduction of those kinds of um, criticisms. I don't think we should stand for that either. So I've probably chewed up my time, have I? No? Okay. So um, I guess the other thing too is when I, when I look at this and think about this, it actually changes who, who I am. Because if I stand in this country, I can talk about the places that I know and the places that I was born and have lived in and all those things. If I situate myself in here, I don't really know where to touch the ground. And it's not that I'm good at levitating or anything, but I think that having the capacity to be able to um, be suspended and try to unknow things is something that we, I think we like to think that we do, but I'm not convinced that we do. So I reckon everybody should go and um, spend heaps and heaps of time with conservative people, as many as you can find. <laughs> and even if you've got to like eat meat. Um, <laughs> you know, drink like expensive champagne, force it down. Um, because I think the I think the more time we spend in circles that are not our own, including the knowledges that I think are untapped, and again, I don't think we're entitled to them. I think we've got to work really in humble ways. Did I just say that? Humble ways to figure out what we can um, learn and spend time in those circles that we're criticising because sometimes we're criticising things that we have no experience of or we have no um, relationship with. And frankly, I don't think that's socially just. So, I can't believe I said that out loud either, but this is where I am. So I think there needs to be a new way. I think we need to um, also consider on behalf of and with, what does that actually mean? We also need to invent new consultation processes and maybe consultation isn't actually 
the word to describe what we do to get people's ideas and put them together. Um, maybe that's a problem too. I am struggling at the moment with, delightfully struggling with um, the educators that I'm privileged enough to work to think this, the word leadership is um, so problematic. We need another word that doesn't have leader in it to talk about leadership. And I, I keep using going, I hate that word, I hate that word. And I keep saying it. Um, because that will always draw us back into political leadership, community leadership, who's the activist, who isn't. Um, because I've learned very recently, so I'm working at the University of New South Wales, the early years people, and there they are, they're magnificent people. And they've been doing this stuff for a long, long, long time. And um, somebody like me, it's hard for me to find a place where I can actually work and do what I want to do. And, you know, for 15, 20, how old are you? 500, yeah, 15, 20 years, 50 years. They've been working this way so that somebody like me can slip in and actually do a bit of work that I want to do. And, you know, that's, that's a story that's not necessarily a public one. And one of the, one of the women who directs one of the centres, Annette, she, um, she got all these amazing stories and the way she talked about social justice, it was like this everyday activism. And I reckon that would have way more impact than some of the big policy critique that people like myself have engaged in. It's those stories, you know, when you're talking about Liam, who's, who's silenced and who's um, speaking, you know, where, where's she today? Where's her voice? Where's her story? Where are those actual moments of life that she wouldn't necessarily consider as activism, which are the most incredible activist stories that I've heard about in a long time? And I think, you know, what else is there that we're not necessarily listening to because we haven't thought about it, we're too busy, it's not on our radar, um, we don't know who it is, who's that person on the audience? And, you know, that kind of stuff gets in the way of actually thinking um, who could guide us into a different kind of space. So I actually feel quite free that I'm now with the liberals um, and learning and listening. And it's very interesting to, um, to not debate the point but listen to what it is and try and figure it out. A lot of it I don't understand it is like hearing a new language. Um, I do feel myself kind of wanting to react but I think the more we resist that and the more we put ourselves into uncomfortable spaces then the more opportunity there is for um, getting whatever it is that we want. So I don't know whose activism it is anyway. I don't know on whose behalf we're doing it because I was thinking if I could really lay it all out without any um, <coughs> restrictions, I kind of got stuck because unless we've got something to fight against, it's like we can't do anything. And that's why I think using the word advocacy, advocacy is sort of on behalf of. Activism is about changing and reconstructing and reconfiguring. And I think if we want something new, we have to think activist. And it is a, it is a, a dirty word. And those of you who remember the gay care scandal, Tom and Parks, lesbians everywhere, um, the, I remember a parent came in and said, um, oh, Miriam, they were talking about you on the radio. It was Lucy's mum. They were talking about you on the radio. I thought, oh, God, they'd call me lesbian on the radio, whatever, it wouldn't be new. They were talking about it on the radio, and, she, and I said, what did they say? She said, they called you an activist. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, wow! And she, but she saw that as really negative, and then I thought, okay, well, what do we mean by activism? Who are we excluding by using that language? <laughs> are we nicer if we're advocates? Does that mean <coughs> people have got more power over, us if, power over us if we are? And I'm not saying, excuse me, <coughs> I'm not saying activism is the right word to use because maybe we've got to guise ourselves. Um, but I think we have to be very critical of the language that we can take for granted. Not to not use it, but to be able to say, you know what the devil's advocate or you... Excuse me. <coughs> you know what the devil's advocate um, arguments might be, and therefore, rather than getting all cranky because we've actually got nothing to say, we can actually listen in new ways and come up with a dream that is sustainable, that is institutionalised. Now, one thing I can't remember who I was talking to, but Marianne Fennick um, and Catherine Baum and I, you know, we kind of have our, our little soirees together, and we were talking about Medicare. The Liberal government will never abolish Medicare. They might raise the levy, lower the levy, tweak it, give it a new name, paint it pink, whatever it is. It's too risky 
to do something with Medicare because it is so indentured systemically. It is something that everybody's attached to and it will never, ever, ever, it'll change and morph, but it will never, ever go, in my view. There is an education levy. It's not as well known as Medicare. Um, early childhood is not part of that. So there is actually an opportunity, and we spoke with um, a guy who's kind of a political, um, what's his, anyway, thing he does that. And um, so smart, like hates from him. Um, needed a man to save us. Um, so, um, he, yeah, and he was talking, he, he was kind of saying, well, you know, how, how do we begin to advocate for something that's existing that we can turn, reconstruct, reconfigure, and actually slot ourselves into? And maybe, maybe, just maybe, that could be a way that we can. Um, indenture it so that it can never, ever, ever be taken away from us. The NQF is um, precarious. It's like a pair of rollerblades at the moment. And, um, you know, I'm the first one to leap out and critique it, and I, I will and I should, and like my colleagues have also done, and we got criticised for that, saying, well, that's so dangerous. If you do that, we might lose it. But we have to be able to do that, because now we're really good at arguing about why we want it and what it can do and how it can be improved in, in, over time. So I think um, having a think about what you really want and how the NQF is a stepping stone to that, or if you want to keep it as it is, how the NQF is enabling in terms of thinking through systems and getting something so indentured, like Medicare, that it just is. Um, that's my kind of practical strategy. I don't have the dream to go with it. I don't have the voice to be able to meet with everybody. Um, but. Anyway, that's my suggestion for the day. So I just want to say thanks to those of you um, for inviting me because I am a person who doesn't get invited places. <laughs> <laughs> I think come to those parties. Um, and it's really, um, yeah, it, it's, I, I'm grateful to be able to have a space to speak because whether or not you agree with my point of view, um, the opportunity to be able to express it is a privilege. And I think that... Um, yeah, the more points of view we can throw together, the stronger we are. Diverse points of view will give us a stronger kind of united force rather than everybody getting on the same page. So um, I'd like to thank you and I hope you have a wonderful day and I can't wait to watch all the videos because I've missed them all and I'm like... Anyway, thanks very much. For